TradeMoneyATM.com. Chapter 8 of The Art of Money Getting. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston. The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum. Chapter 8. Learn Something Useful. Every man should make his son or daughter learn some useful trade or profession, so that in these days of changing fortunes of being rich today and poor tomorrow, they may have something tangible to fall back upon. This provision might save many persons from misery, who by some expected turn of fortune have lost all their means. End of chapter 8. Recording by Jill Preston. Chapter 9 of The Art of Money Getting. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston. The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum. Chapter 9. Let Hope predominate, but be not too visionary. Many persons are always kept poor because they are too visionary. Every project looks to them like certain success, and therefore they keep changing from one business to another, always in hot water, always under the harrow. The plan of counting the chickens before they are hatched is an error of ancient date, but it does not seem to improve by age. End of chapter 9 Recording by Jill Preston Chapter 10 of The Art of Money Getting This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jill Preston the Art of Money Getting by P. T. Barnum. Chapter 10. Do not scatter your powers. Engage in one kind of business only and stick to it faithfully until you succeed or until your experience shows that you should abandon it. A constant hammering on one nail will generally drive it home at last so that it can be clinched. When a man's undivided attention is centered on one object, his mind will constantly be suggesting improvements of value, which would escape him if his brain was occupied by a dozen different subjects at once. Many a fortune has slipped through a man's fingers because he was engaged in too many occupations at a time. There is good sense in the old caution against having too many irons in the fire at once. End of chapter 10. Recording by Jill Preston. Chapter 11 of The Art of Money Getting. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston. The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum. Chapter 11. Be Systematic. Men should be systematic in their business. A person who does business by rule, having a time and place for everything, doing his work promptly, will accomplish twice as much and with half the trouble of him who does it carelessly and slipshod. By introducing system into all your transactions, doing one thing at a time, always meeting appointments with punctuality, you find leisure for pastime and recreation, whereas the man who only half does one thing and then turns to something else and half does that, will have his business at loose ends, and will never know when his day's work is done, for it never will be done. Of course, there is a limit to all these rules. We must try to preserve the happy medium, for there is such a thing as being too systematic. There are men and women, for instance, who put away things so carefully that they can never find them again. It is too much like the red tape 
formality at Washington, and Mr. Dickens, circumlocation office, all theory and no result. When the Astor House was first started in New York City, it was undoubtedly the best hotel in the country. The proprietors had learned a great deal in Europe regarding hotels, and the landlords were proud of the rigid system which pervaded every department of their great establishment. When twelve o'clock at night had arrived and there were a number of guests around, one of the proprietors would say, Touch that bell, John, and in two minutes, sixty servants with a water bucket in each hand would present themselves in the hall. This, said the landlord, addressing his guests, is our fire bell. It will show you we are quite safe here. We do everything systematically. This was before the croton water was introduced into the city, but they sometimes carried their system too far. On one occasion, when the hotel was thronged with guests, one of the waiters was suddenly indisposed, and although there were fifty waiters in the hotel, the landlord thought he must have his full complement or his system would be interfered with. Just before dinner time, he rushed downstairs and said, There must be another waiter. I am one waiter short. What can I do? He happened to see Boots, the Irishman. Pat said, He... Wash your hands and face. Take that white apron and come into the dining room in five minutes. Now, Pat, you must stand behind these two chairs and wait on the gentleman who will occupy them. Did you ever act as a waiter? I know all about it, sure, but I never did it. Like the Irish pilot, on one occasion, when the captain, thinking he was considerably out of his course, asked, Are you certain you understand what you are doing? Pat replied, sure, and I knows every rock in the channel. That moment, bang, thumped the vessel against a rock. Ah, be jabbers. And that is one of them, continued the pilot, but to return to the dining room, Pat said the landlord, here we do everything systematically. You must first give the gentlemen each a plate of soup, and when they finish, then ask them what they will have next. Pat replied, ah, Ah, uh, I understand perfectly the virtues of Schistam. Very soon in came the guests. The plates of soup were placed before them. One of Pat's two gentlemen ate his soup. The other did not care for it. He said, Waiter, take this plate away and bring me some fish. Pat looked at the untasted plate of soup and remembering the instructions of the landlord in regard to system, replied, Not till you have eight your supper. Of course, that was carrying system entirely too far. End of chapter 11. Recording by Jill Preston. Chapter 12 of The Art of Money Getting. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston. The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum. Chapter 12. Read the Newspapers. Always take a trustworthy newspaper and thus keep thoroughly posted in regard to the transactions of the world. He who is without a newspaper is cut off from his species. In these days of telegraphs and steam, Many important inventions and improvements in every branch of trade are being made, and he who don't consult the newspapers will soon find himself and his business left out in the cold. End of chapter 12. Recording by Jill Preston. Chapter 13 of The Art of Money Getting. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston. The Art of Money Getting by P.T. Barnum. Chapter 13. Beware of Outside Operations. We sometimes see men who have obtained fortune suddenly become poor. In many cases, this arises from intemperance and often from gaming and other bad habits. Frequently it occurs because a man has been engaged in outside operations of some sort. 
When he gets rich in his legitimate business, he is told of a grand speculation where he can make a score of thousands. He is constantly flattered by his friends, who tell him that he is born lucky, that everything he touches turns into gold. Now, if he forgets that his economical habits, his restitute of conduct and a personal attention to a business which he understood caused his success in life, he will listen to the siren voices. He says, I will put in $20,000. I have been lucky, and my good luck will soon bring me back $60,000. A few days elapse, and it is discovered he must put in $10,000 more. Soon after, he is told, It is all right, but certain matters not foreseen require an advance of $20,000 more, which will bring him a rich harvest. But before the time comes around to realize, the bubble bursts. He loses all he is possessed of, and then he learns what he ought to have known at the first, that however successful a man may be in his own business, if he turns from that and engages ill a business, which he don't understand, he is like Samson, when shorn of his locks. His strength has departed, and he becomes like other men. If a man has plenty of money, he ought to invest something in everything that appears to promise success, and that will probably benefit mankind. But let the sums thus invested be moderate in amount, and never let a man foolishly jeopardize a fortune that he has earned in a legitimate way by investing it in things in which he has had no experience. End of chapter 13. Recording by Jill Preston. TradeMoneyATL.com